So I'll, we will get started. It's 7.34. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Hei Wan. I'm the um, chair of the World Federation Public Health Association Oral Health Workgroup. And we are really pleased to have this session, um, the future of global oral health in global perspective. Our presenters, um, our six, seven presenters are from all different countries, um, representing different time zones. And thank you, extra thank yous for those who had to join like after midnight. It is just amazing. Um, the reason that we designed this um, session is, is very simple and clear. There is a, such an amazing momentum on global oral health, uh, driven mainly by World Health Organizations. And there are like this international level report coming out every other month. So it's very fast paced and it's great um, to have this oral health visible and elevated as a global oral health, global health agenda and public health agenda. But we are also wondering, I mean, this amazing um, documents and reports with a lot of indicators and strategy and things, what do they really mean to each different context? And how are we working to make this whole documents and strategy in reality. So that's why we want to hear from our presenters from um, different contexts and different countries to see how we collectively move this post uh, forward. Hmm. Just to have uh, give you a quick introduction about World Federation Public Health Association. Um, it's not a dental organization, it's a public health organization. So each country level um, public health association or public health school can join as a member. And a federation, we have about 130 member of National Public Health Association or School of Public Health. So if we sum up all those members of each country's public health association, World Federation Public Health Association represent about 5 million public health professionals, including doctors, nurses, dentists, um, researchers and all those uh, amazing people who are working in public health sectors. So it's quite meaningful for us because we are already, oral health worker is already integrated into public health agenda through the Federation. Mm. And we interact with other work group a lot, uh, maternal health, tobacco control, and so on, to really elevate oral health as a global health and public health agenda. Hmm. So all of us here, uh, presenters and myself, uh, we are from Oral Health Work Group of World Federation Public Health Association, and we're going to highlight some of our activities by our members, um, highlighting their work in their own context and countries, how to elevate this global oral health momentum. Hmm. So without further ado, I will pass the mic to Kieran to introduce the first presenter. Um, we are going to hold on to our questions until we finish all the presenters, but you are free to type the questions at Q&A session or chat, and we are going to answer as many as we can. So with that, thank you so much, and I will pass the mic to Kieran, our vice chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Pascaline Kenyatala. She's an assistant professor in the Faculty of Dental Medicine and Oral Health Sciences at McGill University. Her areas of research focus on social innovations in dentistry, specifically the implementation and evaluation of community and technological innovations. Dr. Tala's research is informed by integrated knowledge mobilization, a stakeholder-centered approach throughout the research process to ensure that findings are more relevant to the end users. She has expertise in mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative research, in using of theoretical frameworks, and in several knowledge synthesis. Thank you, Dr. Tala. Would you like to share your screen and begin? Thank you, Kiran. Thank you. Can you see my screen? I can see your web browser. Would you like to share the slides? Yeah. So let's see. Yeah. 
Is it okay? Yes. Nope. So, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone, again. Thank you for the organizer committee uh, for this wonderful event about the future, future perspective in oral health. And also, I would like um, also uh, to, to give the title for my presentation about enhancing digital technology in dentistry that are the result of the global digital oral health readiness study. I would like to recognize that McGill University, McGill University is located on a land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous people, including the Adonanshi and Nationalic Nation. McGill are now recognized and respect this nation as the traditional steward of the land and water on which we meet. This, uh, the result of this project is the, the, the report of uh, a strong collaboration between McGill University, University of, Mont uh, of Montpellier, World Health Organization. So I would like also to thank Bobo Foundation for to give, our, to give us uh, funding for this project and all participants to this project. So, what is uh, the current gap about digital health in oral health? As we know, oral health is a key indicator of overall health, well-being, and quality of life. And now, during um, the, the slogan uh, of the World uh, Health Day was, uh, oral health also is a human right. So, dental practice have an impact on environmental sustainability, you know, and uh, during the last years, oral health has been uh, neglected and uh, not including in universal uh, health coverage. But now we have a good momentum, like one you mentioned, about the recognition of oral health, like uh, the global health. In this case, digital uh, technology could be used like a, a strategy to optimize oral health and oral health care system and to contribute to universal health coverage and sustainable objective for health, mostly by providing accessible, efficient, equitable, and essential oral health care services. So what type of activity we have done with uh, in this uh, collaborative project. Before to mention uh, our result, I would like just to back in the e-health life cycle. E-health life cycle, like uh, the innovation cycle, is a continuum, a continuous uh, process where we have different uh, steps about development, implementation, integration, and sustainability. And for the development, so at the development level one, um, critical aspect is um, the readiness. So before to implement any innovation, we is uh, uh, interesting to ensure that people who are going to um, implement or to to be affected by this innovation are ready to adopt it. So we have three level of um, of uh, readiness. We have macro level, meso meso level and micro level. At the micro level, we have governmental readiness, organizational readiness, and societal readiness. Um, so governmental readiness refer to the policy, the availability of funding, organizational um, readiness, the same about management support and societal readiness include inter interaction. So, Interact, interaction of healthcare institution with uh, community and government. At meso level, we have uh, structural and technological readiness, and finally, structural and, te structural and technological readiness, the same. And final, finally, micro level uh, include uh, engagement readiness, core readiness, and public and, public and patient readiness. So this project was a mixed method study with all uh, WHO member states. We received uh, 
approval, ERB approval from McGill University Institutional, uh, uh, Institutional Review Board. Participants include all chief dental officers from all WHO region or their representative. So finally, this project includes like uh, 83, 83 countries and uh, all countries from um, all uh, countries from WHO member state. The survey, uh, we have a survey about different aspects of digital health, including teledentistry and health, M health, uh, electronic health record, capacity building, so training for the undergrad and graduate student, legal uh, framework, any aspect about the, the, the legal, um, legal, um, um aspect of the implementation of digital health big data social media and the second uh, the second pass was uh, an individual uh, interview with uh, volunteer people who want to give more detail about the uh, eor health in the country so we receive many information about the barrier and facilitators, different level of readiness. So we we the the result were focused mostly on governmental, so macro and meso level where we have governmental readiness, structural readiness, and technological readiness. Among the barrier, we have a governmental priority or competence priority where oral health was neglected between other healthcare, uh, health uh, uh, issue. We have um, also some barrier related to uh, oral health policy funding, <clears throat> including private, uh, uh, public and partnership between uh, private and public funding or the donor also. We have also one element related to infrastructure. So the availability of resources and equipment. And finally, like we all you know, the qualified human resources, so capacity building issue. However, 80% report of a participant report that they need WHO support to implement e oral health intervention, like a, technical guidance or support and advice to help them in this uh, in this process how this project is uh, matching with uh, goha so digital health is uh, is the this is the principle six of goha referring to optimizing digital technology for oral health where digital technology could be used improve um, to reduce oral health inequality also to like uh, a driver to achieve um, uh, universal health coverage so in gohab we mentioned the relevance of digital health to promote oral health literacy so it's so one of digital health determinants to increase competencies in digital oral health skills so to use it to reduce digital health um, Gaps, digital scale gaps, develop uh, policy uh, le legislation, so legal framework and infrastructure, to improve access to care, including telehealth, uh, telediagnosis, teletriage, telescreening, and also to develop and strengthen data protection and privacy policy. We know that data privacy is uh, one big issue in digital ed. And finally, we could leave, uh, leave it, uh, digital health to avoid digital divide. So equity is uh, one uh, aspect that uh, it will be great also to avoid or to reduce digital uh, device with digital technology. Conclusion, digital oral health technology <clears throat> have the potential to help uh, in addressing critical public health issues including improving access. However, the implementation are uh, ended by several challenges, like mentioned, some barriers, including policy, uh, funding, 
a lack of training, infrastructure limitation, a poor access to essential equipment. It's time now to advance and leverage on digital technology in dentistry. For instance, uh, develop um, a global digital or have a scale up plan and try to find implementation strategy and to share any um, a good practice in different contexts and to see how we could adapt in another context and develop and implement a toolkit on evidence-based digital oral health intervention. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Pascaline. That was wonderful. Uh, we will now move ahead with our next presenter, Dr. Kenneth Eaton. And um, Dr. Arthi Shanmugavel, who unfortunately could not be with here today because of the time conflict. So Dr. Eaton is going to present on her behalf right after his presentation. Professor Kenneth Eaton is a specialist in periodontology and dental public health. He is currently a visiting professor at two UK universities, Kent and um, Portsmouth. And he's the advisor to the Council of European Chief Dental Officers. He has been a vice president or the advisor to the World Federation of Public Health Associations Oral Health Work Group since its foundation. And Dr. Arthi, um, Dr. Arthi Shanmugavel is a faculty of healthcare informatics at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. She's a research analyst and doctoral candidate at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. And she's a member of the Oral Health Working Group at the World Federation of Public Health Associations for over 10 years with active contribution. Thank you so much, Ken. And I will share the screen for your presentation. Well, thank you very much indeed for doing that. It will be great. So, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to do these two presentations. And Arthi sends her very best wishes. The first one is this overview of the WHO Global Oral Health Action Plan 2023 to 2030. There's a typo there, that should not be 24. So my apologies for that. <laughs> uh, thank you, next slide please. So what are the objectives of this uh, plan? Well, there's six and the first is governance to improve political and resource commitment to oral health, to strengthen leadership and create win-win partnerships within and outside the health sector. And I think this is important. We cannot be in a little isolated island as oral health. We, if we're going to be successful, we have to really get much more integration with all areas of health and social care and indeed with the community in general. It is no good just being dentists and dental hygienists and dental technicians sitting in our little offices and waiting for people to come. We have to be out there and uh, giving the message. The next strategic objective is oral health promotion and prevention to enable all people to achieve the best possible oral health and address social and commercial determinants and the risk factors of oral diseases and conditions. Now, we're lucky here because our risk factors, as you know, are common to most NCDs, most non-communicable diseases. So if we are addressing this, then we are helping people across the, the board, not just in their mouths, but with their bodies and life in general. So that is a key point. The third objective is to develop an innovative workforce models and revise and expand competency-based education to respond to population oral health needs. And this is where we have to involve people outside our oral health. And I'll be coming on to that later. Then the fourth point is oral health care to integrate essential oral health care and ensure that related financial protection uh, uh, is given so that it can be available to all. And of course, you know that in some of your countries, uh, oral health is not free. It is, you have to pay for it individually. And if you are socially economically deprived, it is extremely difficult. So there's a big issue here. 
Some 12 years ago, it was estimated that only 12% of the population, global population, had seen a dentist in the one year. That is an incredibly low starting point. Point five is information systems to enhance surveillance and oral health information systems. And in a sense, Pascaline has started addressing that point. There's a whole lot of issues there, um, and she's started covering them. And the number six is research to create and continuously update context and needs specific research on public health aspects of oral health. So big, big issues there. Next slide, please. There are also 94 specific actions to help member states achieve these objectives. And there are two overreaching global targets, which are that by 2030, 80% of the global population will be covered by essential oral health care. Remember that I mentioned that only 12% of the population had seen a dentist uh, globally um, some 12 years ago. Big, big target there. And that the global prevalence of oral diseases and conditions will show a relative reduction of 10%. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what's been achieved so far? Well, it's the first time that WHO has recognized oral disease as a major problem and has developed an action plan to address the problem. Another typo there, not and, but and. So I do apologize for that. The profile has been raised to improve the situation and the inclusion of all diseases in WHO's plans for non-communicable diseases. There has already been an early success in Greece where there is virtually no funding whatever for oral health, particularly for adults. And uh, there has now been a breakthrough and the government have promised to improve the situation. And that is most encouraging. You can read all about this in Community Dental Health. There was this editorial published uh, last month, and I recommend that to you. And there's a big discussion on what is essential oral health care. Is it just prevention and uh, management of pain, or is it restoration, or, or what exactly is it? And more importantly, what can be afforded? And in some countries, um, it's going to be very hard for them to fund uh, publicly available oral health care, which means that a lot of the population will still not get it. In others, which are very developed, they're quite worried about this because they have very good comprehensive and quite expensive systems in some Northern European countries. And they are worried that the governments might say, well, we don't need to fund all this you know, they're not essential. They're more for um, embellishment and aesthetic reasons rather than for functional and health reasons. So there's quite an interesting debate going on there. Next slide, please. So I have a huge concern about this. How do we assess the outcomes in 2030? Well, the WHO have published an oral health status report with a country profile. And in each country profile, there is what's described as baseline data on the prevalence of oral diseases, lip and oral cavity cancer, risk factors, economic impact, policies, measures and resources, oral health workforce, availability of procedures to detect, manage and treat oral diseases, and oral health outcomes. But sadly, and some of you will know about this because I've been going on about it for at least 13 months, these baseline data are not baseline. They are not, as is uh, given in, the, um, in this report from 2019, some of them are very ancient data. And indeed for the United Kingdom, our data for the prevalence of severe periodontitis in adults comes from a survey carried out in 1988. Now, when you have rubbish data like that, how can you really have a true baseline? And the United Kingdom is not alone in this. In the, there is absolute rubbish data in a lot of these things. And it is a big problem. How on earth can we come to valid conclusions if we haven't got good baseline data? Thank you. Next slide, please. 
Well, I've had my little rant on that, and I hope I've done it in five minutes. So I'll now give you Arthur's presentation. And this is Integration of Medical and Dental Records. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, despite the World Health Organization recognizing uh, integral role in overall well-being, there are all these barriers which are there. And one of them is integrating medical and dental care. Now, if we're really going to have comprehensive care, then we need to have um, need to have uh, well interoperable systems with data integration and information exchanges. Next slide, please. Next slide. And what is interoperability and why is it important? Well, according to HIMES, and that stands for the Health Information Management System Society, interoperability is as described on the slide here. I won't go into any detail because I've been told that I'm running out of time. So next slide, please. Next slide. And these are the barriers to integration, political will, cost, concerns over data protection, the complexity of merging information, public and private sectors, uh, labor, who is going to provide the digital competency and capability, decentralization of records, so instead of being kept nationally, they are kept locally, and infrastructure in some uh, countries where there are a lack of computers and IT skills, and then, of course, patient consent. Next slide, please. But the enablers will be safer and better patient care, <clears throat> wish for efficiency and cost saving. Everybody in the population can have a personal health identifier. We will need political will at all levels, well-developed IT systems, and a good definition of control and the amount of information that should be shared by dentists. Now, the oral health group has already, in combination with the Fédération d'Ontario Internationale, the FDI, carried out a global survey to see, are there integrated health and social care records? And this survey had responses from over 80 countries. And we found that in a number, there are in fact integrated, but a very small number. And these include Estonia, Sweden, and some of the Gulf states. So these countries have managed to do it. And we really need to encourage all countries to end up with this integrated system of not just medical and dental records, but health and social care records. Next slide, please. Thank you. That's the end. So uh, I hope I've got through that uh, high one in reasonably quick time. And I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of all the presentations. Thank you so much, Ken. We now move forward to our next speaker, Dr. Seema Lal. Um, Dr. Lal works as a dental specialist at Tamari Ora at the Ministry of Health in Cook Islands in the area of children's dentistry and orthodontics. She's dedicated to promoting maternal and child oral health and reducing early childhood caries in the Cook Islands and the Pacific region. Her doctorate research is developing a culturally relevant and shared model to strengthen oral health in early childhood in the Cook Islands. Tamare Ora, in collaboration with the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, which is UNICEF, has recently put together an integrated nutrition program for young children and mothers. The floor is all yours, Seema. Thank you. You're on mute, Seema, if you could unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, kia orana and a warm Pacific greetings to all. I'll be sharing the present work being done in addressing maternal and child oral health challenges in the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands, uh, for everybody's information, is located in the Polynesian region of the Pacific Ocean with a population size of 15,400 based on a census report in 2021. It is divided into two major groups, Northern and the Southern group. And as Karen said, Temerai Oro Ministry of Health Cook Islands is the main healthcare provider. 
The present health infrastructure in the Cook Islands has made it possible to address maternal and child oral health challenges. The Cook Islands Health Strategy 2023-2027 targets maternal and child populations through key result areas for oral health. And together with Health Reorientation Plan 2024, Plus, Healthy Cook Islands 2030 Plus, which is the flagship program of the Cook Islands, the recent changes allows alignment to WHO Global Oral Health Action Plan, integrating oral health in primary health care settings, adopting a risk identification, early intervention, and prevention approach. Its uh, efforts in sugar taxes and control of tobacco further aligns its advocacy for prevention. The recent digitalization of oral health screening data allows connecting service provision to maternal and child populations in the Cook Islands. The Baby Teeth Matters program, which is known as Epuopinga Katoate Nio Tamariki in Cook Island Maori, is delivered through the Healthy Cook Islands 2030 initiative, addressing the maternal and child populations. These include oral health screening and integrated nutrition programs, which aims to improve oral health of pregnant women promoting healthy feeding practices for the first thousand days uh, for the children, creating awareness of the lift the lip practice in all communities and empowering communities for routine oral health checkup. The oral health nutrition program has two components. The first part of the workshop shares information on WHO and UNICEF recorded feeding guidelines. The second part has a group activity on meal planning for age groups six months to preschool. The participants are encouraged to use local foods which are healthy and readily available. They're also encouraged to have these meal plans done without added sugar and low or no salt content. And this is also to address the challenges of childhood obesity in Cook Islands and also to address the future risk of NCDs in the Cook Islands. The Pepe Paonu Committee, these are images from um, a cooking demonstration done in one of the islands in Mitiaro, um, which is located in the southern group in the Cook Islands. The Pepe Paonu Committee is made of mums and grandmothers in the Cook Islands. This group on the island of Mitiaro had a cooking session where they prepared meals which they had planned at the workshop previously, and they planned these meals without added sugar or salt. For the first time ever, they were really delighted to see that their children were actually enjoying meals without sugar and salt. The findings from the maternal and child oral health screening. Um, we screened 20 pregnant women in the Southern group and all of them had a large amount of untreated dental disease. The 131 babies screened we noted to have poor feeding practices. One third of them had early childhood caries already or initial lesions or severe form of early childhood caries. During this screening and workshop, we distribute health kits which have toothbrush and toothpaste for mums and babies, and also a face cloth to start uh, cleaning baby's teeth early enough. There's also information card which contains immunization schedule for the Cook Islands, information on feeding practices and oral hygiene uh, care in pregnancy and in early childhood. The future directions. Temerai Ora Ministry of Health Cook Islands is committed towards developing maternal and child oral health integrated policy framework. It is also exploring pilot projects for integration such as midwifery and oral health integration. Through my research, will inform the development of a proposed model to strengthen oral health in early childhood in the Cook Islands and future multi-sectoral collaborative projects. May Takimata, thank you. Thank you so much, Sima. Thank you, that was great. Um, we'll move ahead to our next presenter, Dr. Sonia Groisman. Dr. Groisman um, is a postdoc and research professor at DNA Lab Diagnosis Biology Institute at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. She's a retired professor of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, is a consultant to the Global Child Dental Fund in the UK, and a member of the Oral Health Work Group at the World Federation of Public Health Associations, as well as a board member of the Alliance for Oral Health Across Borders. And I will share the screen for you, Sonia. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me 
and to give me the possibility also to interact with and know all your different perspective of view and similarities that you have seen here. And uh, I am from Brazil, as Kyron said, and I uh, made a presentation very strict according this the titles I we Karen sent. So we are going to talk about future directions of our health. But first, if you can pass another, it's necessary to know our own uh, own situation before we think of telling about what perspectives will come on the future. So in Brazil, we have a program called Brazil Sorridente that's from uh, uh, Public System House, and it's like, say, integrated system. Although, if when the, it, we have many difficulties in accessibility and other problems, but uh, this was the DMFT in different age groups, you can see in the bottom of the presentation. And although, we had a great decrease on caries on five and 12 years because we have this school program that has been launched many years before and has had a lot of uh, effort on that. After the school children, people leave the schools at age of 15 to 19, the DMFD just doubled from two to four and, and when you have the mass major uh, relevance of uh, caries, and then when you come to 35 to 45 years, you have higher DMFT, and then more than 65, all of loose tooth. So something is not going on when you see that this is a scale that you can prevent and control caries to a certain age, but then when the populations are not on, inside the program, they just develop new caries and we end up with a lot of people needing endodontic treatment, rehabilitation, and uh, or partial or total rehabilitation. And here in the other graph, I just make different parts of the country. So we are a continental country. So in each part, we have a different DMFT and different situation. So in the north part of the country, the worst part is a higher DMFT. Can you pass the other, please? Karen, can you, yeah. So what are our needs and population's priorities? Our needs are maternal and child orientation and dental treatment, and to have dental pediatrics that are not yet in the Brazil Sorridente program. There is a great need of endodontic treatments, as you said. It's a great need of oral partial and total rehabilitation. We need to increase accessibility, and there is a constant need of paradigm shift to join medicine to promote general health through oral health. And we have uh, population difficult to assess, like Kilambola population, there are descendants of Africans, past from slaves. So we still have these in our countries and we cannot uh, have access to all these places. Native Brazilians, that are Indians, they are also some uh, in remote area that we cannot, they don't have access. Riverside populations in Amazonia, rivers in other places that there is very difficult to have access. And uh, populations living on, on the streets, urban population living in conflict areas. So all these are uh, population priority because of the very difficult access they have to dental treatment. Can you pass the, the other one, please? 
So how does this situation align to WHO Global Oral Health Action Plan? It's because the program is based on prevention, it's based on family population, and there is uh, an oral team that offer dental trim all to almost a high, very, very high percentage of Brazilians. Brazil has 11% of all dentists in the world. And above them, almost 8% are working for the government, part-time at least. So, but still there is a, a, a constant need of uh, education and in towards prevention and uh, and also these difficult barriers of uh, getting together with medical system. So the national politics of oral health is also based in social determinants and the government advocacy not only prevention of oral disease, but also encourage control of sugar, tobacco and alcohol. The system of uh, unique system of health, that's how we call it in Portuguese, is implementation program and action plans on digital health, such electronic medical records and teledentistry. So we have universities having teledentistry as a second opinion. But of course, we are a continental country and this is uh, not possible yet to have in all countries like that. Next, please. And it's two of our priorities. We have early child carries and it's burdening the country as in the world. And we have very good school programs, but the question is why in some communities and some countries, the perfect program of oral health and school are not even enough to promote health. So it's a time to change directions. We had the opportunity to have this study that I participated with my post-graduation students. It was the strategy of multidisciplinary treatment of babies' dental clinic. So we had a dental clinic baby only for kids from zero to three year old. Because it, and it was in a medical center because the dental school only receives kids after three years. So this was uh, integrated with nutrition, with pediatric and um, formal physicians and dental care. And we could see uh, uh, and with this program that they arrived with a lot of caries. And as we, we start making more uh, coming back, men, men, to recall, we are getting less carries. So as the group that had come four times per week, four times per year had much less carries than the one that come once per year and that the one that comes twice per year. So once per year is the purple, the green one was twice a year and the red one was four times per year. And when they come and when receive oral health orientation, also nutrition orientation. And also when the doctor says that they should do that, so all orientation, then we are able to have less caries. And next, please. As a conclusion, I would say that uh, human mouth is a blessing ecosystem teeny with microscope life, and this microscope life is affected by social, economic, and cultural determinants. So oral health does not end in the mouth. It's uh, periodontal disease is related to cardiovascular disease, and group of bacteria are described in, in the wall brain, in the head, and they can increase the risk of stroke, so these uh, small slides in end show that Streptococcus mutans CMN plus was see in Alzheimer's patients' brains also collect. So and these are the patients of uh, ulcers and 
cancer gastricus because the Helicobacterium pylori is also in uh, oral biofilm and uh, we have constant ulcers repeating. So the, the shift of treating ulcers has changed, but they never include oral health. And why they come back each six months? Because they have to, to have dental treatment and they don't have dental treatment, but they have endoscopy for six months. So if they dent, they treat also oral health, they might have less ulcers. And, and we also know that periodontal disease in pregnant women can increase the risk of uh, pre bird babies. So oral biofilm could indicate also different states of oral carcinogenesis. So it was uh, a, uh, published just this month on uh, Journal of Periodontology, published now and uh, in April 2024. So I think it's a great need and I put this things of uh, house sand so beautiful that sometimes you construct so many nice things based on treatment the past disease and we don't have we have to, to start working in basic science so not to have a house that will be destroyed or built just uh, by water if you do not base on science and if you do not integrate oral health to general health so thank you very much. And sorry if I have over past the time. Thank you so much, Sonia. <laughs> thank you. Um, I encourage all our attendees to please send the questions to our panelists using the chat. And now we move forward to our final speaker, Dr. Rachel Martin. Dr. Rachel Martin is a dentist and a specialist in public health dentistry with more than 30 years experience working to improve equity of access to oral health care for clinical and public health, education, research, advocacy, regulation, and leadership roles. In 2017, she founded the Australian Network for the Integration of Oral Health with colleagues to improve oral health for all Australians through the provision of early access, evidence-based information on preventive care. Rachel, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Apologies, I was muted, of course. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you uh, and presenting from the land of the Wadawurrung people in the southern part of Australia. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present and those emerging. And I'd like to um, talk with you tonight about what's happening in Australia. Um, my country, Australia, has a population of 26 million people with a very low growth rate, 1.2%. We are a federated state. We've got six states and two main territories, and this means that there's a lot of power sharing that goes on, particularly around health issues, and the state and federal governments are constantly wrangling over relatively small amounts, particularly of the oral health funding um, with a majority of the oral health care system is privatised and most of the dental cost is borne by individuals. In fact, you'll see on that chart there, um, individuals, uh, almost 60% of the, pay almost 60% of their costs. But if you add the private health insurance in, which individuals are paying for, you're up to about 80%. Now, this compares to... Um, if you think about it, uh, the opposite is true for our general healthcare system. We actually have a universal general healthcare system in Australia, which is highly regarded and, and well thought of generally, um, and pretty much uh, the most that, an ind that individuals contribute to it is around 10 
or 11% of, of annual funding for healthcare. So we have a situation where um, it's totally reversed with, with oral healthcare. In fact, our oral healthcare system sits right outside of the general healthcare system, essentially. It's it's quite separate. Um, and on top of that, um, and because of that, what we see uh, each year, and these figures are from 2020, 2021, um, that our rate of potentially preventable hospitalizations is is very high. In fact, um, population rate of 3.2 per 1,000 um, in 2021, um, it was the second highest cause. Oral Preventable um, oral health conditions were the second highest cause of preventable hospitalisations after urinary tract infections. Um, so this is not improving. In terms of um, those preventable hospitalisations for uh, Indigenous Australians even higher at a rate of 5.4 per thousand people. Um, and interestingly, we're a very large country with a relatively small population. We have a lot of, um, we have major cities with the majority of the population, but we have some very remote areas. And what happens is that that um, potentially preventable hospitalisation rate increases with increasing remoteness from uh, major um, urban areas. So um, needless to say, um, in conclusion, in the context of Australia, our government treats oral health quite separately from our other oral health, other health services in terms of funding, service infrastructure and planning. In terms of our needs, Australia's oral health needs, from 1994, the proportion of Australians suffering oral health problems has been increasing, as you can see by this, this graph here. Um, this is the little, um, little infographic that I just put together because I think it really is uh, our, our national secret disgrace that um, there really is such a wealth gap of seven teeth between those who have and those who have not. Um, one third of Australian adults suffer from moderate to se or severe periodontal disease. One third of adults and a quarter of children, five to 10 year olds have untreated decay. One third of Australians skip or delay accessing dental care when they need it due to cost or fear. Um, public dental care is poorly and inadequately funded. Only 15% of eligible Australians will are able to get care in a year from a public dental service. And the public waiting times are at least 12 months and getting up to three, four or more years in some states. It's really difficult to recruit staff in the public sector, particularly in those rural or regional areas. Last year, um, our government set up a special committee to investigate and um, uh, inquire into the provision of and access to dental services in Australia. And most notably, they found inevitably um, high costs were barriers, long waiting times, trauma and fear, inaccessible services and sparse services in regional areas. Interestingly, and um, not surprisingly, um, a lack of cultural safety as well with few Indigenous or, and Aboriginal um, oral health professionals. There were a lot of submissions to this um, inquiry, um, many uh, organisations and many individuals. There was a very strong call for leadership in oral health in our country. We know that it's not the work of dentists and oral healthcare workers alone who are ever going to be able to address the scourge of these oral diseases. They're preventable, they've got common risk factors with many other general diseases, and they can also be detected through early screening. And so with my colleagues through our network, we're committed to a social and systems change that is really needed 
to ensure that oral health is included in all health. Um, the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you some examples of how this is being done in Australia. With examples, um, you can see here of simple validated screening tools. Um, there's a program around um, pregnancy and maternal and child health, a screening tool that has been developed there and training, CPD training programs um, in diabetes and oral health education. So we've developed training programs for diabetes educators and developed um, screening tools and tested them. We have developed um, tailored oral health promotional resources. Um, we, sorry, I'll just move to the next slide. This is an example of the um, maternal um, uh, integrated oral health program that has um, been developed um, with a range of organisations, including the um, Australian Centre for the Integration of Oral Health that uh, has been developed through our network. Um, and we um, really believe that there's many other oral health care workers who have the capacity to be able to screen um, for oral diseases in the course of their everyday care. And so this is part of the work that we believe is really important in spreading the load, essentially, as Ken has said. There's no point us thinking that as dentists and oral health professionals, we can manage this. We just can't. So our approach is really to get this social change happening and systems change as well. Um, simple referrals following screening and, and training and information that actually provides health professionals with what they need to know about what is wrong and where can someone go. We also have developed um, things such as um, undergraduate and pre-service training programs, such as this one for um, midwifery and nursing, and um, lots of opportunities for input into guidelines, such as for stroke management and diabetes. Um, and, and additionally, um, lots of work is being done around um, acceptable, feasible and effective models of care. So, sorry, I'm just moving on. Um, in terms of the Senate inquiry into um, the uh, Australia's, uh, Australian population's access to dental services, there has been recommendations that have been made in general, and there have been a number of specific recommendations made. The government is yet to respond. They are overdue in their response. We're not sure what it is they're going to say, but our very strong hope is that there is at least the establishment of some leadership in oral and dental health. We have never had in Australia a chief oral health officer, and we have strongly called for that in this inquiry. Um, we are hoping that the government respond and uh, and and promise that they will implement a number of recommendations that have been made around oral health, in particular with respect to aged care and seniors in our um, in our population who are sorely lacking in access to services, to dental services. Um, and we really expect and hope to see a commitment by the Commonwealth Government to increasing some funding for public dental services. So ultimately, um, the work that the, the net, myself and colleagues have um, have created is around six areas of, of um, action and they are the cogs that you see here. So leadership, um, we need a consistent and growing voice for change from Australians and for Australians. Engagement, we intend and we work on connecting people to create change. Advocacy is making the case for change using the evidence. 
dissemination is providing the evidence for change in a format that's ready to use for wider and some of the more specific groups, such as the health professional bodies, the health services, the educational institutions, the consumers, target populations and healthcare funders. Education. This is around providing, developing robust models, uh, robust methods and models and materials for teaching and training the workforce and, and consumers and simple ways that they can integrate oral health into their daily business because everyone has the role to play. And then there's research, developing the evidence for change, the translational research. So I did something a little bit out there and I did a little overlay of the oral, the global oral health um, strategic objectives and um, had, a, had a little think about where we're at with them in Australia. And I really think we've got quite a way to go around the oral health care area um, with uh, the, that's a strategic number four, strategic objective number four, around integrating essential oral health care and addressing those social and commercial determinants and the risk factors, quite a way to go there. Um, with the oral health promotion and prevention, um, we we also have quite a way to go. Our hope is around governance at the moment um, in that leadership perspective, which I mentioned, we're hoping that we're seeing, I mean, we've got groups like ours, which is a large network across Australia that's bringing together people to try to stop the the, um, the replication of things and the waste of time and to turbo boost what we are doing and really use the evidence um, that is available to just build upon upon what we know is right and what works. Um, and we also hope that um, we get uh, some movement on uh, the surveillance systems. Um, we expect, we really hope that we can, we have nothing in Australia in terms of um, solid and consistent um, surveillance. Um, I think we are making um, progress, as I've mentioned in the previous slides, around work, um, around health workforce and research. So, you know, we're we're making we're making progress, but it is slow, and um, it's just fantastic to share with everyone. And I hope that we keep doing that and building upon that. Um, and just finally, I'd like to. Um, share with you uh, a paper that myself and colleagues um, um, published, which was a attempt to um, put together, it was actually a, a review that was conducted in collaboration with WHO aligned with the Global Oral Health Action Plan. Um, it aims to, we aim to just really provide program planners and policymakers and decision influencers with a list of evidence-informed strategies that would integrate, that to, to integrate oral health care in a non-dental primary care setting. So I commend that to you. And, um, and this beautiful picture of the moon rising over the western coast of Australia. So thank you very much. And I'll finish there. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you so much, um, presenters. This was a marathon, <laughs> but it was amazing. It was amazing. Let me summarize it quickly. Um, we started with the Pascaline, Ken, and Arthi, uh, focusing on electronic dental record, um, digital record, and how to integrate oral health into medical and social record um, using different country cases. We had a maternal child health case in Cook Island, integrating oral health into nutrition program for mothers and children. Uh, we had a Brazil case. Uh, Sonia made a great um, argument how oral health integrated to other part of body biologically. And also um, Rachel 
um, the public oral health challenges in Australia, the progress, and also where to we need to put more effort on. And um, the MCH midwifery uh, program was quite amazing. And I'm pretty sure we all have something to learn from there. Mm. But that was surprising, Rachel, the 12 month waiting. That's quite long, very long. And Australia is not low or middle. That's the country. lowest amount, Taiwan. <laughs> mm. Mm. So it's this terrible. is not just low and middle income country problem. It's everybody's problem, actually, oral health. In that sense, there is equality here. <laughs> Everybody has a problem. So I have a two questions that I already put on the chat. Um, very 3,000 fit level question, million dollar question, but I'm pretty sure we don't have answer, but we have wisdom to share. So the first question, where do we start? Yes, we need to do research. We need to develop workforce, alternative workforce. Uh, we need to develop care models, the electronic records. And we have to do the financing model, universal health coverage. Yes, we know that six pillars of WHO oral health action plan, but how can we make a decision where to start with the limited resources in time? So I want to start with Ken, most wisest man in the room, <laughs> to share your wisdom with us. There we go. I don't know that I'm the wisest man. I think I'm the oldest, perhaps, but you don't necessarily <laughs> get wisdom with age. <laughs> anyway, I really think we've got to embarrass our politicians, really embarrass them. Um, we've had a very good example in this country, uh, not to do with health, but to do with our post office workers. Uh, they have little post offices and nearly 900 were prosecuted for fraud when a new computer system was brought in. And that was a dreadful thing. They were, they were not guilty most of the time. And there's a huge national scandal. Um, and by really uh, embarrassing our, our politicians, we've actually slowly managed to get something done about it. Mm. But it's interesting to hear the situation in Australia because we have the reverse here. In 1948, we included oral health in the National Health Service. We, we excluded podiatry, whereas I understand being a down under, you put feet in your program, but you didn't put mouths. Is that right, Rachel? No, feet in our mouths, unfortunately. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, that's yeah. right. Mouths are so, just left out. But, but we've gone to the situation where because uh, not a lot of funds have been relatively put in as a percentage of GNP into healthcare, increasingly public health dentistry, publicly funded dentistry has had less and less. And our dentists now do not wish to work within the NHS. So we have these huge waits for treatment. And in some parts of the country, you literally cannot find a dentist who will treat you within the NHS, you have to pay privately. And that it is not perceived by politicians in a lot of countries that there is an issue. It would be great if they all got searing toothache on a Saturday night at about midnight and couldn't find anybody to cure them for several hours. That would be one encouragement to them. But I think what we have to do is to find lots of really sad cases publicize them, go to the press, go to the media, use anti-social media to be social. I mean, there's so many bad things coming up from anti-social media, but we can use it as well to promote and to show the, the real need for things to change. So that's my suggestion. Thank you so much, Ken. I, I want to react to it and also answering um, ZM <laughs> as question. Um, Yes, um, embarrassing politician or give a sense of urgency definitely needs. I will put that lens a little bit different angle. And I think there should be a fair incentives for workforce. Mm. What I mean by this, we can train public health focused, primary healthcare care for dental hygienists, dental therapists, dentists, all those, and then train them well that's so they are equipped to work in public sectors. Uh, in Maryland, state of Maryland, United States, uh, they just passed a regulation that dental hygienists work, can work independently um, 
in those public sectors and also can work with a primary health doctor, not dentist, primary health doctors for pregnant women and things. But in those cases, the incentive is not uh, comparable or fair compared to the workers in private sectors. So we are depending on a good heart of the workforce. Can you serve the, the needy populations without giving a fair condition to work and continue to work? So recruitment is one thing. Retainment is another thing. So I think there should be a structural change, politicians, systems change, uh, really to help this good-hearted public health workforce to work happily. Um, I'm training public health community oral health officers, but I, I can't guarantee if they will not go to into private sector one day, if their pay and living and working condition is not uh, fair enough. So I will just open the box, Pandora's box. Rachel, do you have any wisdom to share? Oh, it's um, the, exactly what you have said is true here in Australia. It's a very big issue here, and it it um, is worse uh, um, further from the cities. So where I work in rural areas now, um, we have half the workforce that we need um, for our funding. So what we have to do with our half of our funding is actually give it to patients to take to the private sector um, and use it with private sector oral health providers but the problem is that it's not a it's not a comparable service because it's not patient centered they don't get a whole you know the whole person approach they're just seen for the care that they urgently need and that's it they you know they've got their emergency care etc so um it's it's a really big problem the the it's 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 becoming a bigger and bigger gap the difference between what's provided publicly and what people can achieve um through private if they can afford it so that that um uh little cartoon infographic i did that is it's so true it really is it's the biggest difference i think between those who have and those who have not in a in a country that is supposedly, um, you know, a, a, a wealthy country. It's mm -hmm. really sad. Mm -hmm. So true, so true. Yeah, I, I don't know what we do about it because we rely on the goodwill of people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we came this far and we will not give up. So we will see. No, and, and just one more thing I would say is yeah. that I, my true belief now is that the only way we can we can address these this scourge of disease worldwide is to get all primary healthcare workers trained in basic screening and referral and basic prevention and common risk um, health promotion. Mm -hmm. That is that is we have to do that. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I will move on to my second question. I think. No, was... I don't have a question. Oh, yes, sorry. I, sorry. I, sorry. I have my hand. I think that the, that's a so very important question because we should start teaching the Anto students together with medical students. Mm. So before we start saying, of course, we have to train also people that are already working. But uh, those who are coming from the universities, they had to be already trained together. So, because then they are coming with a, a different view. And I think this could be a policy that all the dental schools should uh, teach the dentists together with medical schools because they don't have this policy. Although, at least in Brazil, we have this. Uh, national Brazilian of uh, teaching dentistry, but they don't have this legacy, this mm -hmm. policy. And I think also, uh, once there was a policy in Brazil that people who work more in prevention receive a little more money 
than those that are only working on restorations inside the, the dental clinic. So, it, but this disappeared. It was just for a while. I think this is a real policy to like uh, compensate it who wants to come and work more in prevention because uh, as as uh, as Australia in Brazil everything depends on each one heart mm -hmm. so even we have policies we have to empower people and mm -hmm. one way it's giving better salary it's uh, right. this and so I think it's two ways to so the mm -hmm. ungraduate people and the postgraduate people that are already working. Definitely, definitely. Well said, Sonia, well said. Pascaline? Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, I want just to add, uh, like my colleague mentioned, uh, beyond the national, so the policy and the dental uh, workforce or healthcare workforce. I think patient is also one aspect that we need to think also uh, mm -hmm. because the patient perspective, patient experience or patient acceptability of any innovation could also uh, drive uh, the change. So uh, that was just my point. And while during my presentation about readiness, readiness is uh, really important mm -hmm. because um, the policy should be Develop according to the the goal, according to the available resources in one context, because we have different contexts with different reality. So um, uh, every uh, every context, each context has a uh, the own reality that we we cannot just transfer the knowledge that we have in one context to another one, but mm -hmm. policy is definitely a key mm -hmm. the, the the beginning but in the same time i could say we have a multifaceted approach you know this policy workforce but in the same time the patient also is a considerable component mm -hmm. great thank you so much for insights um we are our time is up um so i will ask a, a last question and you can answer with the reaction emoji are we hopeful? Are we hopeful that <laughs> the global oral health we can achieve and one day, someday, we will see oral health completely rebranded and repositioned as a primary health care for all? Are we hopeful? Yes? Good, good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for staying more than an hour, hour and 20 minutes. That's a long time. But I'm really glad that we recorded this session. Thank you all who joined uh, from the beginning. Um, we will post this link to our Federation webpage as a resource to start our conversation, how different situation we are from, but how similar problem we have, but we are quite determined as a clinician, as a researcher and academic and politi uh, polit policy leaders, um, we will all together move this ball and post forward. And I, when we get together and have this conversation again, maybe next year or year after, I want to see some progress, tangible progress. And I think we will. So thank you so much for all the presenter who joined today. Um, and uh, we will end our meeting here. Uh, and we will take a quick last pictures. Kieran, why can you help to take a picture? <laughs> or this thumbs up or heart. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Oh, hi, Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.